Let's examine a simple yet compelling reason why you should abandon null hypothesis significance testing, or what is commonly known as the p-value. Now it has been known for quite some time that significance testing is highly problematic and that it should not be the primary tool we use to draw conclusions from our data analyses. And if you wish to understand exactly why significance testing is problematic, then I recommend you read the papers listed on the screen. And if you read only one of these works, I highly recommend Hubbard's Corrupt Research, which was published in 2016. The reason I'm going to focus on in this video, though, is that for the vast majority of research conducted in the social and life sciences, including research you're probably conducting in your laboratory now, the traditional p-value does not tell you what you really want to know from your data. Now why is this so, and what do you really want to know from your data? Well, to answer these questions, let's examine a study from the Reproducibility Project. The authors of this study used a variation of the Stroop task to investigate how individuals would learn associations between particular word color pairs. Now, there were 432 randomized trials of word color pairs, like the ones shown on the screen. For this first block, Loop was presented in the color blue six times. Now, this represents the high contingency condition. Also in this first block, Call was presented in yellow three times. This is the medium contingency condition. Here in the second block, Loop was presented twice in three different colors, and this is the low contingency condition. Now, as the 432 word color pairs were presented, the participant was required to select the correct color within 500 milliseconds. The general expectation was that the high contingency condition would produce the fewest number of errors because the participants had learned the word color association and therefore could select the appropriate color correctly and quickly. The number of errors were then expected to increase for the medium condition and be the greatest for the low contingency condition. Analysis for the replication data are shown on the screen here, and a repeated measures ANOVA revealed a statistically significant result, p less than 001. Now consistent with expectation, the greatest proportion of errors was found for the low condition, followed by the medium condition, and then the fewest errors were found for the high condition. I've also plotted the means here with the proportion of errors scaled 0 to 1 to more accurately reflect the differences between the mean proportion errors. Now what is the inference being sought by the researchers with this analysis? In this case, it is the inference to population parameters. Here, for example, we have a sample of 50 students with an observed mean equal to 0.33. Now we treat this specific sample mean as an estimate of the population mean. This is the inference being sought. We are trying to make an inference from the specific sample to the more general population. Another way to think about it is that we are trying to make an inference from the observed mean of 0.33 to the unobserved population mean. That this is the inference we are attempting to make is perfectly clear when we look at the null hypothesis for the repeated measures ANOVA. Here we see that the three population means are expected to be exactly equal. But this is not the inference being sought by the authors of the study. Consequently, these were not the appropriate analyses to conduct for the study. What the authors were instead seeking was an inference to best explanation. Now here, for example, we see a student working diligently at the computer. We can observe his responses to the word color pairs and we can tally his number of errors. Now what we infer to be underlying his responses is a contingency mechanism that explains why he made the greatest number of errors in the low contingency condition. Now here we see another student and her responses can be explained using the exact same mechanism. Now we do not observe the mechanism directly. We only see the responses of the two students. We infer the existence of the mechanism and we offer it as the best explanation for the observed responses. To see clearly that the authors of the study were seeking this inference, figure one from their paper provides a threshold model that explains why the fewest errors were expected for the high condition and the most errors were expected for the low condition. Now this threshold mechanism is thought to offer a better explanation of the data than what the authors referred to as the modulation hypothesis or mechanism. Now this threshold mechanism 
is also thought to be operating within the cognition of every participant in the study, as is clear in the author's description of their hypothesis. Quote, the contingency hypothesis claims that participants use response prediction to speed responses on high contingency trials. There are undoubtedly many mechanisms that could be proposed to explain how this occurs. For the purpose of this article, we test the a priori hypothesis that participants prepare for a response by simply lowering the threshold for the expected response and do not alter the threshold for any other." Close quote. Notice there is no mention of a population or population means in this quote. Only participants are mentioned along with the causal mechanism explaining their individual behaviors. With this in mind, an analysis more suitable for drawing an inference to best explanation needs to be conducted, and one can be found in the observation-oriented modeling software. We refer to this analysis as an ordinal pattern analysis, and we start by setting up the expected ordinal pattern for the errors, as can be seen here. Next we examine each person in the study to determine if his or her errors match expectation. In this example, the ordinal relations among this person's errors matched expectation perfectly. The ones here indicate the ordinal pattern for the person's observed errors. For this example, the ordinal relations do not match perfectly. And for this person, the ordinal pattern of her errors was exactly opposite of expectation. Our primary question then is how many individuals' patterns matched expectation like the first individual shown on the screen here. Well, analysis revealed that only 80 of the 242 persons matched expectation, which is reported here as a percent correct classification index. The individual errors across the three conditions are shown for the 80 individuals in the graph, and clearly this low PCC value is not good news for the contingency mechanism. Interestingly, 18 persons, about 7% of the sample, revealed ordinal patterns that were exactly opposite of expectation. Here you see their errors plotted across the high, medium, and low conditions, and it would be interesting to know what, what went wrong basically with these 18 participants. And lastly, we see here the remaining 144 persons in the study whose patterns of errors were not entirely consistent with the expected ordinal pattern. So altogether then, 162 participants, or 67% of the sample, yielded patterns of errors that failed to support the contingency mechanism. Again, this is not good news for the proposed mechanism. To summarize then, we have two inferences to consider, the inference to population parameters and the inference to best explanation. Now, the authors of the Stroop study were clearly seeking the inference to best explanation because they were seeking to garner evidence for a general explanatory mechanism that operated within the persons of their study. The significance test did not allow the Stroop researchers to evaluate this inference. As I stated earlier, the p-value never tells you what you really want to know from your data. What you want to know is how many people in the study behaved in a manner consistent with the inferred causal mechanism. And we gain that knowledge here by avoiding the p-value and analyzing our data using the OOM software. With all of this being said, how can you be confident that you're not interested in estimating population parameters? Well, as a quasi-litmus test, I'd like you to consider the importance of drawing random samples in your research. Let's consider political polling, for example. Here the explicit goal is the estimation of population parameters in order to project the winner of a political race. Now the most important concern for the researcher in this type of work is sampling, because the estimates must be unbiased and as accurate as possible. Now of course the ideal case is to draw a random sample. As Kirk points out, Inferential statistics are used in reasoning from a sample to a population. Convenient samples, unlike random samples, don't provide a sound basis for determining the properties of populations. And if random sampling is impossible, the political pollster will at least attempt to draw a representative sample, but this still requires a great deal of effort and expenditure of resources. So the questions to consider as part of this quasi-litmus test are, one, how much time, effort, and resources am I putting into the selection of a random sample? And two, how much effort am I putting into defining the specific population to whom I am wishing to generalize? If you are like most social scientists who study undergraduate volunteers from a participant pool, 
then you're not putting any effort into drawing a random sample from a specified population. Consequently, you are not seriously interested in making valid inferences to population parameters, you should completely avoid significance testing or the p-value, and you should adopt newer methods of analyzing your data like those shown in this video.